Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, everybody for joining us as always. And I will say we'll just give it a moment for people to join in. We have a really wonderful uh, presenter, Dr. Lewis, today and really kicking off um, the celebration of a number of uh, presentations this month, Celtic Black History Month and American Heart Month. I'm now looking forward, most importantly, to turning this over to Dr. Don. Dr. Don and Dr. Salas have been really uh, critical and crucial in helping set up this series of events this month. So thank you so much. I also want to just mention Dr. Harmon has been helping set up a lot of great speakers for next month, as well as we celebrate Women in Medicine Month. But I'm turning it over now, Dr. Dunn. Thank you so much for everything you've been doing, and I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Osdalga. Okay, good morning, everyone, and happy Lunar New Year. It is Black History Month, and my remarks are part announcement, part call to action. First of all, thank you to the communications team for providing some of these great backgrounds to commemorate Black History Month. They can be found on the DOM website as well as in the chat. Thank you so much, um, Helena, for putting those there. Um, also, shout out to the Diversity and Inclusion Council and Drs. Caceres, Harmon, and Salas for their dedication to this work, and they are my partners in DEI. Now, before you slap that Black History Month background up, I want you to really take a moment to think about what it means and why you're doing it. So Black History Month started in 1926, and um, it all, I should say, it all started in 1926 when Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History announced the second week of February to be Negro History Week. It evolved into a month-long celebration in 1970, thanks to the educators, some educators at Kent State University. The month was established to celebrate the historically neglected contributions of Black Americans to our country's history, and it became, an, it became official in the mid-1970s. As I always do, I want to remind you that your Black colleagues walk in Blackness every day and experience all that comes with that 24-7, 365. So I urge you, again, to think about why you have that background this month and think about the commitment you can make to supporting, supporting the Black community when you take it down. How will you show up 24-7, 365? Now, there are no shortage of opportunities. Um, you can support a Black-owned business, volunteer for a campaign to, to fight voter suppression, mentor a trainee from the SCORE program, apply to be a mentor or scholar in the LEAD program, read how to be an anti-racist or cast, educate yourself on slavery and its impact on our society today by reading or listening to the 1619 Project. Which brings me to my first announcement. We will be having a discussion of episode one of the New York Times 1619 Project created by Nicole Hannah-Jones. You still have two weeks to listen to the fight for a true democracy, which is the name of the first episode. We welcome you to join us virtually for an in-depth and hopefully thought-provoking discussion on Tuesday, February 15th at 5 p.m. And we'll pop the link for the registration into the chat. Next slide. Now, part of this conversation centers on giving a voice to voices that have been historically silenced or overlooked. So I wanna show you some data for what progress we've made in the Department of Medicine. Um, just looking back a couple of years illustrates how far we've come. So here are the data for Black, Indigenous, people of color, Grand Round speakers. And as you can see, we've grown by leaps and bounds, I'd say, with 12% of last year's speakers being BIPOC. So we're certainly not done with this work and we'll continue to ensure our Grand Rounds have BIPOC rep representation. Last year was the first time we decided to commemorate Black History Month with all Black speakers for Grand Rounds, and we'll do the same this year. We have an amazing lineup for this month, which will include Dr. Kimberly Manning from Emory, Drs. Lahia Yamane and Carmen Powell from the Department of Pediatrics. And we will end the month with a special event, a combined Grand Rounds and Health Equity Summit lecture featuring Dr. Kamara Jones from Morehouse School of Medicine. Of course, we're kicking off the month with a presentation by Dr. Eldrin Lewis, our very own Dr. Eldrin Lewis, and so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Harrington. Thank you, Dr. Dunn, uh, not only for uh, your leadership during uh, Black History Month, but for all that you've done to make us a better department, a better community with your colleagues, Dr. Salas and Harmon over the course of uh, the last few years. So deep appreciation to you and your colleagues. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna move into uh, our main grand round speaker this morning. 
And as Dr. Dunn said, I, I have the privilege of being able to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Eldrin Lewis. You'll note that on some of our slides, uh, we have both acknowledgement of Black History Month and a heart. February is also heart month, and it's very fitting that Dr. Lewis kick us off as our chief of cardiology here at Stanford. And uh, as we celebrate Black History Month and we celebrate Heart Month. Dr. Lewis, a, a native of Mississippi, received his undergraduate degree at Penn State University. He received his MD at the University of Pennsylvania before moving to Boston, where he had a long uh, tenure, first as a, uh, an intern, a resident, a fellow, and a fellow in cardiac transplantation and advanced heart failure at Brigham and Women's Hospital. During that time in Boston, uh, Dr. Lewis also received his MPH at the Harvard School of Public Health. He was there for 18 years, and uh, he was then successfully recruited here. Uh, thank you to Dr. Joe Wu from the CVI and Dr. Joe Wu from CT Surgery for leading that search that was, uh, uh, that was ultimately successful in convincing Aldrin to move his many talents west to, uh, to Stanford. Eldrin is now the Simon Sturzer Professor of Medicine, as well as the Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine here at Stanford. Eldrin has a large presence on the national scene in cardiovascular medicine. He's an elected member of the Association of University Cardiologists. Uh, through his work in the Association of Black Cardiologists, he served as the longtime leader of the research committee. Within the American Heart Association, he has many, many leadership roles over the course of the last 20 plus years, but most notably, he's recently served as the chair of the largest scientific council within AHA, the Council on Clinical Cardiology. And currently he has one of the most important leadership roles within AHA. He's the chair of scientific publishing overseeing all 11 of the AHA scientific journals. Eldrin's own research is concentrated in the area of caring for and understanding the care received by patients with advanced heart failure. He uh, has led some of the pivotal clinical trials, investigating new therapies. He's also, I think, most importantly known for contributing to understanding quality of life, including the instruments that we use to measure quality of life uh, in our patients with heart failure. Increasingly, he's been interested in improving diversity in the participation in clinical trials, and he's leading a number of team science efforts uh, in that. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Lewis, who's going to talk to us today about health equity, at least seen through one lens, that of the patient. So thank you, Eldrin, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Harrington. I really appreciate that warm, um, that warm introduction. And I have to say, I'm truly honored not only to be here and to be able to serve Stanford University as the Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine and to be the, the inaugural Simon Sturzer Professor of Medicine, um, but also to uh, have an opportunity to kick off this month, both Heart Month and Black History Month for, um, for uh, uh, improving outcomes for all. So these are my disclosures. And over the next um, 40 minutes or so, what I would um, hope to accomplish is to discuss strategies to improve outcomes in heart failure, including prevention, treatment, and health equity, to understand the role of quality of life as an outcome in patients with heart failure and as an anchor for medical decision-making, and then to describe future strategies for managing patients, both in clinical trials and practice. So as you know, uh, heart failure really has come a long way. From the time that we were considering heart failure as dropsy and uh, chewing on foxglove um, using mercurials for the treatment to the time in the early 1980s when we really just had loop diuretics and digitalis as the anchor for treatment, um, we have increased options for the management of these 6 million people in the United States. Survival and quality of life have improved dramatically and uh, management has been uh, much more complex and one of the drivers of our subspecialty. Uh, this slide is just to depict the advances that have happened. Uh, so if you start with the, uh, the introduction of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, you can see that there's a constant uh, improvement in the overall uh, risk for uh, mortality uh, with an overall risk reduction of about 63% uh, in all patients uh, with, with heart failure. 
And in fact, if you look at the drugs approved in, in heart failure by indication, um, certainly in the early days, uh, they were often improved uh, or approved because of hemodynamic or physical functioning. Um, but then quality of life and symptoms um, have been um, really important uh, for uh, several medications that were approved. Uh, hospitalizations alone uh, for two of the drugs, but um, really mortality and morbidity, uh, morbidity, basically hospitalizations and mortality for the lion's share uh, of the drugs that represent the, the four key pillars of, of heart failure management. And so now the focus is on both quantity and quality of life. I would say that we all play a role. Uh, so this is not a cardiology issue, a heart failure specific issue, but in fact, all of us play a role because uh, prevention is quite important. So we have the stages of heart failure, stage A through D, the patients who are stage A are at risk, patients who have genetic polymorphisms um, or pre, uh, pre, you know, uh, risk factors, but they have no structural disease. You have stage B patients who have structural disease, but no symptoms. And then the lion's share of the patient structure, the, the stage C patients who are symptomatic at some point, and then the advanced stages of disease. Um, when you look at quality of life, really in the beginning, it's all about preservation of quality. And this is a difficult concept, which I'll get into over the course of this talk. Um, but as their disease progresses, we're focused more on improvement uh, to try to get them back to where they were before. If you look at strategies to improve outcomes in heart failure, certainly there are a variety of things that we all work on. Um, the foundation is the basic science and translational science that many of the faculty in cardiovascular medicine and actually Stanford at large are doing. Um, but we certainly wanna optimize medical therapy, uh, come up with better strategies to move from the trials to the bedside, have better uptake of medical therapy post trials, management of HEFPEF, assessing and improving prognosis, as well as symptoms and quality of life, advancing heart failure, management of comorbid illnesses, and virtual business and digital health impl implementation. What I will focus on over the next few minutes is just uh, what we can do on the inpatient side, as well as strategies for 30-day readmissions, talking about health equity and racial differences, and address some of the cost issues related. So once again, I kind of uh, alluded to the fact that we all are heart failure doctors. We all are a part of it. And the reason this is important is that 85% of patients across the nation who, are, who, have, who live with heart failure are being managed by non-cardiologists, by primary care doctors, family practitioners. And so I actually think we need to start at birth. Uh, primordial prevention, weight loss, exercise, avoiding toxins. And this is really important as uh, children kind of uh, move to their uh, teenage years. Early identification of genetic polymorphisms, dietary changes, and better screening uh, um, uh, processes. But for primary prevention, we want to control blood pressure, control sugar, reduce proteinuria, have better cardio protection during cancer treatment. That's why we have the specialty of cardio-oncology, behavioral changes, as well as all of the components of primordial prevention. And then secondarily, um, patients who have myocardial infarction have better uh, you know, uh, immediate MI care and post-MI care, uh, aggressively identify and treat stage B cardiomyopathy, treat peripheral arterial disease, CKD, proteinuria, and once again, components of the primordial and primary prevention. When the patient gets admitted to the hospital, uh, certainly you want to establish the etiology if they have new onset heart failure. Oftentimes, because 50% of heart failure is related to coronary disease, a catheterization is often done. Sometimes we can do CT angiography. Uh, look for reversibility, because if we can have heart failure uh, improved, uh, where you take an, a patient with symptomatic reduced ejection fraction heart failure and normalize their ejection fraction and their symptoms, their mortality rate is dramatically improved. And we really don't know the life expectancy of those patients. Uh, oftentimes labs are, these are some of the standard labs. You want to achieve uvolemia. And oftentimes we don't, uh, we don't achieve that. We often discharge patients uh, before they're uh, optimized. And in the transition period, they may develop acute kidney injury, which can prompt uh, readmissions, or they may become uh, chronically underdiuresed and have persistent symptoms. Um, stabilize comorbid conditions, and this includes some of the common things that our patients have, and establish uh, GDMT, including algorithms um, to achieve the maximal dose and um, include maximum uh, behavioral modifications to help. But we also want to restore their functional capacity. And part of that is the expectation. Are we able to get them back to their pre-heart failure levels or not? 
and using the cardiopulmonary exercise test to better strategize how these patients are. But once again, it is a team effort and we have a great team here at Stanford. Um, and it involves not only the cardiologists and the primary care doctors, but all of our APPs, the educators, the physical therapists, the surgeons, nutritionists, the psychiatrists working on depression and anxiety, which are commonplace, as well as the chaplain. The 30-day readmissions becomes a really challenging issue, as many of you know. Um, I actually think that uh, this is very similar to the project management uh, triangle. If you want to get uh, construction done, remodeling done, you, have, you can get two of three, uh, speed, cost, and quality. If you get speed and cost, it'll be low quality. If you get speed and quality, um, you know, the, cost, uh, you know, the, the, um, the cost will be high. And if you have um, a low cost and high quality, then it's, um, it becomes um, a little slower. So all of this is something that we need to do because uh, really it's 30-day admission, length of stay, and mortality. And in fact, if you look at the length of stay, um, if we have longer length of stay, which we see in Europe, you do see traditionally uh, lower readmissions and lower mortality. As we shorten length of stay and uh, reduce 30-day readmissions, we are seeing a trend towards higher mortality. And this is something that needs to be addressed. And if you have a shorter length of stay and a lower mortality, unfortunately, the 30-day readmission rate would be higher and this can have some financial penalties. Uh, disparities and uh, the health inequities remain an issue. Uh, this is a study that we did looking at the premier registry uh, with adults uh, with primary diagnosis of heart, heart failure admitted to the ICU, 571 hospitals, 80% uh, white, 20% black, excluded hospitals without cardiolo cardiologists available. And if you look at the primary ICU care by a cardiologist for whites compared with African-Americans, um, you can see that uh, in general, uh, whites were more likely uh, to receive uh, primary care uh, in the ICU by a cardiologist. And this is in cross hospitals, across uh, age differences, and in both males and females, um, as well as um, in rural and urban settings. In fact, if you uh, look at uh, the uh, TopCat study, which we did looking at spironolactone versus placebo, what we see is that um, despite favorable characteristics um, among, um, among black patients, self-described uh, black patients, uh, including younger age and less comorbid conditions, there was a higher overall risk for the primary endpoint, which was a combination of heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular mortality. Uh, if you look at the impact of spironolactone, it was, uh, it was uh, similar in both. However, um, I just wanna emphasize that there's no difference in adherence to study medications. The reason we looked at this is because oftentimes that's a reason, um, an excuse that is used for why uh, underrepresented racial ethnic groups are not enrolled in clinical trials. Uh, there was a 51% higher risk of heart failure hospitalizations despite favorable characteristics. We also looked at uh, health equity in patients admitted uh, to a single heart failure, uh, a, a single hospital. And this was a work that we did when I was at Brigham. And I would just emphasize that this is actually not uh, unique to uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, but in fact, we're seeing this across the country and a lot of people have uh, reached out to me after this. So what we did is look at patients who came to the emergency department with a primary diagnosis of heart failure between 2008 and 2017 and looked at um, where they were admitted, whether they were admitted to a general medicine service, a hospital service or a cardiology service. And what we found is that in general, uh, if you look at um, the 1,300 white versus uh, 465 black patients and 190 Latinx patients, that there were some differences in comorbid conditions. But the, uh, the difference that we found uh, was that um, after adjusting the multivariable model and in the univariate model, uh, black patients uh, who were self-described were 25% uh, less likely to be, um, to be admitted to the cardiology service. Uh, Latinx patients, about 50% less likely to be admitted. If you were to look at age, um, older patients, uh, so patients over the age of 75 were about 40% less likely to be admitted. Uh, females were less likely as well as uh, people who had uh, more comorbid conditions. And even if you look at the risk, um, whether you're looking at um, 2011 to 13 versus 2014 to 17, you can see there was no significant change in this trend. We did a propensity uh, matched cohort. And even when we looked at that, um, the odds ratio was still about 50% for black versus white and uh, about 40% um, for uh, Latinx versus white and also about 25% for female versus male. 
And the reason this is important is if you look at the 30 day readmission rates, it was really driven by the service. The other uh, outcomes were the same, but there was a higher 30 day readmission uh, for patients admitted to the hospital of service. And this was probably in part because there was not the same degree of, of, of transition of care uh, that can often happen on cardiology services. And once again, this is not unique to a single hospital. This was a recent study that was published uh, looking at uh, a retrospective analysis of all emergency department encounters in Maryland, 46 hospitals, Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commissions. And this was about 260,000 patients. Uh, four diagnoses were for heart failure, COPD, pneumonia, and acute chest pain, self-reported at race and ethnicity. And as you can see, um, uh, patients who are Black, um, uh, self-described were 19% more likely to be, um, had a 19% greater odds of being admitted to observation. And um, Hispanic uh, ethnicity was also 11% uh, greater odds of being admitted. Once again, the problem uh, and the concern for this is uh, oftentimes I call the hospitalizations a great equalizer because it allows patients who don't have access to care to actually get on GDMT, to actually get implemented uh, for management of these various stages. Uh, so this is a, a, a review that we uh, recently uh, published oops, um, and uh, looking at how um, kind of structural racism and healthcare disparities can lead to uh, disparities in heart failure and certainly things such as state-sanctioned violence, uh, mass incarcerations, forced relocation, but residential segregation, lack of access to high quality education, toxic exposures within the, the environment, maladaptive behaviors, uh, targeting marketing of health harming substances, uh, food deserts, which makes it difficult to live with the life simple sevens and access to healthy diets, all kind of contribute uh, to these disparities. Unequal employment, including lower earnings, lack of benefit, lack of health insurance and use of emergency facilities for primary health care. And then finally, unequal health care, including implicit and explicit bias, substandard facilities with lower standards, as well as uh, delay or avoiding seeking care due to medical uh, mistrust and lack of workforce uh, diversity. So uh, if I move away from racial and ethnic uh, uh, inequities and look at financial inequities, this is another contributing factor. This is a recent study that looked at uh, patients who are uh, deciding to not even go for therapy or to delay their care. And this was using the medical expenditures panel survey from 2004 to 2015. And when they were asked about foregoing or delaying medical care due to financial and non-financial barriers, what you found is that 60% of non-elderly and 46% of elderly patients with heart failure reported deferring care due to financial barriers. Uh, one of the reasons that they concluded or hypothesized that you had um, a fewer percentage of the, of the uh, elderly patients deferring care was because of Medicare. Once again, the importance of insurance. And the people who deferred care in general had $8,000 extra expenditures compared to those um, who did not uh, forego care. Um, if you look at predictors in general, the non-elderly, um, 2.7 uh, greater odds. Um, and then, but also if you look at um, their uh, cardiovascular risk factors, uh, whether you're average or poor uh, cardiovascular risk factors, whether you have a lower number of uh, uh, comorbid illnesses or not, um, you could see that these were all predictors of uh, greater odds of uh, foregoing or delaying care. And then also uh, the uninsured, uh, once again, becomes a, a big problem. Um, and when people have worsening symptoms, it has significant impacts. They have a lower satisfaction with heart failure treatment. They have greater mental health burden, greater symptom and treatment burden, if you uh, use a KCCQ, a higher out-of-pocket cost. Um, as well as they're more likely to not take their medications as directed. And this is why I've really transitioned from using non-compliance to non-adherence, because there are so many different reasons, and one of those drivers is the cost. However, I would emphasize that if you look at patients who have, have worsening heart failure, they're actually willing to pay more for an additional heart failure drug. Uh, $75 versus $25 is of outpatient cost. So these are things that we have to really consider as we, um, as we manage our patients. And as we do this, we understand uh, that uh, there are many barriers to implementation, including the coinsurance and the deductibles, the co-payments for 30-day refills, the formulary ex exclusions, as well as a, a step therapy. But also, 
the restriction on specialists prescribing certain medications. Because if you live in an area where there's a paucity of specialists, especially in cardiovascular medicine, you're not gonna have that opportunity. Uh, the prior authorization and tiered formula pricing also are significant uh, impacts on barriers to implementation. So what is the impact of financial toxicity? Well, to the providers, it gives us limited care options, right? We're, we're, getting, we, we're spending our time, instead of talking to patients about what they need to accomplish, we're discussing cost versus benefit. Um, we're, uh, oftentimes providers are frustrated and burned out and there's a lot of extra administrative burdens and costs as what tried and trying to explain the rationale for the out-of-pocket costs, some of which we don't even know what it would be. But for patients is oftentimes a choice between food versus therapy, the ration for follow-up, uh, the decision not to seek care and the chronic stress that happens because of these costs. Um, and oftentimes there's less prevention of progression and they come in once they're truly symptomatic and then we lose a, an, op, an opportunity to prevent progression of disease. And we have to kind of consider transplant and ventricular assist device as the only option for continued uh, longevity and quality of life. And I just wanted to, to, to do this uh, just as a comparison. And I'm specifically not targeting cardiovascular costs, which are high. Um, but uh, if we were to compare a hepatitis C treatment, yes, it eradicates um, the hepatitis C in over 90% of cases, $86,000 for a three month therapy. You know, if we were to compare this and annualize this, I could buy a Ferrari 488 Pista Spider. I would love to have that. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis treatment, about $100,000 a year for a standard biologic. I can get a Tesla Model S uh, for that price if I prorate it. And SARS-CoV-2 treatment for the treatment for a monoclonal antibody, which is really important. But once again, if I were to go back to my home state of Mississippi, Unfortunately, and I guess fortunately too, you can get a house like this for about $365,000. So I do this out of just to basically say that patients aren't trying to decide between buying a Ferrari and getting their treatment, but they are trying to decide between paying their rent, paying their mortgage, uh, eating. And it's really challenging when the out-of-pocket costs drive decisions. Uh, this is a recent study that looked at the use of uh, Sucubitril Valsartan and what they found is that uh, in a cross-sectional national population study, 48% of insurances required prior authorization, 27% for Medicare, 57% for commercial plans, and the use of Sucubitril Valsartan was higher in commercial plans, even though it was still low overall. I think one of those drivers is if you have a commercial plan, you can actually get a voucher, uh, and actually the out-of-pocket costs will be considerably lower. These are things that we need to kind of look at strategies across insurance uh, uh, types. Why is this important? Because the downstream cost of these improved, uh, these, these, this higher cost means uh, it, it, it impacts access to healthcare, uh, affordability, acceptability, the accommodating strategies, all driven by cost, socioeconomic status, and access to care. And this can prevent healthy aging, something that we all should be driving for. So as we kind of think about how to optimize care, we need to put the patient back in the center of this. And this is really going back to the Institute of Medicine's um, requirements. And they said that healthcare is that, that establishes a partnership between practitioners, patients, and their families to ensure that decisions respect the patient's wants, needs, and preferences will be really important as they participate. And all of these are really important, that we have to make sure that we understand all of these different components as we try to identify these patients. And one of those things is quality of life. Quality of life has not traditionally been used, but because of work that we've been doing and others have done over the last uh, two decades, I think that it is at a point where it is ready for prime time. We know that all of these are not, uh, are, all of these are important, not equal, and it really depends on the patient. So while death is very important, it's all of the things that happen to that binary event of life and death uh, that's really important. And what we really should aim for is to, of course, prevent all of these comorbid conditions, but also to improve quality of life. So what is health-related quality of life? Well, it's an effect of an illness and its therapy on a patient as perceived by the patient. It excludes the direct evaluation of non-health-related factors. And also it can be used as functional status and health status. There are a lot of domains, and these are all patient-reported outcomes. This is the conceptual model that we put together, starting with biological and physiological variables, uh, leads to symptom status and functional status, which leads to general health perceptions and overall quality of life. We know that the perception, not actual prognosis, but the perception of prognosis can affect all of these. 
Um, we also know that symptom status can impact exercise, but exercise in turn could improve functional capacity. And we also know that there are a variety of factors, including depression and anxiety, that can uh, influence health perceptions and the uh, individual uh, uh, functions, including preferences, personality, motivation, and symptom amplification can uh, impact symptom status. Um, and the environment can also, uh, including psychological support and social and economic support, can also influence, um, uh, can be influenced by quality of life. So all of these from symptom status to quality of life are all patient reported outcomes. And we know that they impact um, adverse outcomes. So as we try to maximize quality of life, we balance uh, medicines, with uh, sur surgery and interventions, with comorbid illnesses such as depression, side effects from the medications, defibrillator shocks, and all of these are really important. We know that uh, quality of life is tightly linked to uh, New York Heart Association class, and I'll, I'll get into that in a few minutes. Uh, as your New York Heart Association class gets worse, your overall quality of life gets worse, and these are uh, higher scores uh, worse with the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Questionnaire. And, and whether you have preserved or uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction, the quality of life is the same. We also know that patients actually uh, don't really quibble in the middle in terms of their willingness to trade time in order to improve uh, their uh, overall outcomes. They're anchored at one or the other. Uh, a lot of patients are not willing to trade any time, and this actually persists from, uh, from more recent work uh, all the way until they start progressing and becoming more symptomatic. The less symptomatic you are, the less likely you're willing to trade. Uh, the longer you're and, and more symptomatic you are, you're willing to trade almost all of your time. And this is important as we develop new therapies. We also know that there are a variety of other factors, including cardiopulmonary exercise tests, the higher your CPET, the less likely you are to trade time. The more volume you have, the less likely you are, uh, the more likely you are to trade time. And also, once again, your New York Heart Association class um, are associated with it. So because of this, uh, oftentimes, I try to improve their outcomes before we make difficult decisions. Um, if we look at uh, therapies, and I'll just highlight a few, uh, sucubitril valsartan versus enalapril, there was a significant improvement, whether you look at the overall summary score or the, uh, the uh, clinical summary score. But if you look at the individual components of quality of life in the Paradigm HF study, what you realize is you don't see a lot of movement and things that we do every day, things that you need to live your life. And you see a lot more movement in things that you do to enjoy your life. And I think these are things that we need to target as we try to come up with better strategies to measure quality of life. And with this, uh, what we found is that with scuba trivalsartan, you basically made pa patients feel about nine years younger uh, in, the, in terms of their measurements of their quality of life. There are a lot of other strategies that have been used, including medicines, management strategies, and behavioral modifications, all of which have shown variable improvements in quality of life. But I would just highlight that some of the biggest changes that you've seen in quality of life improvements have been with surgical and procedural interventions, including cabbage, uh, mitral valve repair and replacement, uh, TAVR, the mitral valve clip, cardiac resynchronization therapy, transplant, and mechanical circulatory support devices. And these are things that, for those advanced uh, patients, that can be important. So does quality of life improve? Uh, does collecting PROs improve quality of life? And the short answer is yes. Uh, so if you were to look at uh, uh, the overall PRO uh, symptom monitoring versus usual care, you do see an improvement in the overall survival probability in managing these patients. And I think this is multifactorial. Um, once again, the goals of treatment is to live longer and live better. Uh, we do have more accurate assessments of health status. Uh, now, and is better than the standard interview that we do in, and better for patient engagement. So how can we use it to make uh, clinical decision-making? Uh, certainly to collect symptoms, to determine stability, which is really important, to identify patients who should be targeted for more aggressive therapy, to provide patient-centered care, and really to educate patients on expectations, to realign uh, their expectations with reality. Um, and uh, this is a study that we did uh, looking at destination therapy left ventricular assist devices. So as you know, uh, patients who basically ended up getting uh, continuous flow LVATs versus a pulsatile LVATs compared to medical therapy actually had significant improvements in survival. However, that is a balance with uh, a one in 10 risk of, uh, or 10% risk of a disabling stroke, uh, two in 10 with serious bleeding that requires hospitalization, and a lot of continuous driveline care and power source management, including driveline infections. 
So we actually did the decide OVAD trial to test the effectiveness of a shared decision making using site based training and um, a video that actually helped patients make decisions by going through this. And what we wanted to do is to see if um, after the video uh, was there concordance. So basically, if I want to do everything that I can to live longer and they choose a no vet, that's concordant. If they say, I want to live with whatever time I have left and there's uh, no LVAT, that's also concordant. And what we found is that with the video, there was a significant improvement in the intervention with uh, concordance um, between what they want uh, and what they actually choose. And this is really important because when we look at patients after VADs, the ones who are most dissatisfied are the ones who struggle with this. And what we found is uh, uh, as we kind of uh, uh, implemented this video, what we found was there was a 26% decrease in patients going to LVAD. And so some people would say, well, that's decreasing volume. I would say we want to make sure that the right therapy fits the right patient. And so making sure that there's concordance is going to be really important. So is heart failure status modifiable? The, the answer is yes. Um, and with uh, if you look at uh, a variety of these therapies, as I mentioned before, uh, there has been some movement in the quality of life. And because of the improvement, now there has been a task force with the ACC AHA clinical performance and quality measures for adults with heart failure. And in fact, uh, two PRO quality measures were added. Uh, and this includes uh, quality measures uh, that's suggested for internal evaluation, um, but documenting a heart failure specific PRO would count as one quality measure and avoidance of a clinically significant decline in health status using a heart failure specific PRO. This is a problem though. And one of the things that we have to do getting back to cost is we have to have cost neutral or actually free uh, documents or, or instruments to measure health status in the clinical practice. Uh, Paul actually, uh, Dr. Heidenreich uh, talked about this in his editorial. Uh, that was recently published, looking at uh, PROs that measure health status throughout a patient's lifetime, looking at cost-centric measures, and also making sure that we're sensitive to care quality than, than mortality. And certainly the Medicare merit-based incentive uh, payment system may require this and, uh, as well, and PROs uh, and PRO reporting uh, could be a requirement that meets this. So can this be done in clinical practice? The short answer is yes. This is a study that we did uh, that looked at uh, measuring quality of life in a heart failure clinic, about 726 patients. One of the things that we found is that only about 50% of patients actually say that quality of life is because of their heart failure. So if we don't actually measure it and ask, then therapies that we think will improve their quality of life because it's targeting heart failure may not address some of the other comorbid conditions. And in fact, if you look at predictors of heart failure as a dominant uh, cause of their limitations, Prior cardiac surgery uh, was a predictor. History of cancer and arthritis, actually, uh, patients were less likely to report that, that heart failure was their dominant issue. Worse uh, functional capacity, as well as a higher body mass index uh, and ejection fraction. The other thing that we found is, even though we think we're really good at assessing New York Heart Association class, if you have a 15 minute um, uh, time in clinic, that becomes really challenging. And so even in class one patients, uh, you find that uh, many patients report limitations uh, to climbing stairs, to walking, uh, to doing yard work, and, uh, and certainly uh, doing more strenuous activity. And some people even have difficulty getting dressed and showering. That does not sound like class one. If you look at class two and class three, you can see the proportion of patients that actually had significant impairment was even greater. And so what we need is to better assess this. And one of the ways to do it is, once again, remember New York Heart Association class is highly uh, strongly associated with quality of life. So if we use uh, quality of life instruments, we actually may be able to speed up the time that it takes to ascertain data. Um, and it can be very important um, routinely um, and is something that we can actually track longitudinally. Um, so there are a lot of other things that we've recommended, including uh, FDA uh, using this for regulatory approval. And uh, fortunately, uh, just a few years ago, the FDA has now allowed uh, PRO uh, data, the KCCQ in particular, um, to be used as a regulatory approval. The one thing, the one caveat I would say is if you're designing a trial that is not uh, blinded, you know, not double blinded, then I would actually have exercise capacity in addition. And the reason is because 
uh, what we found is that the effect size is greater in a non-blinded way when you're measuring quality of life. But that being said, uh, having standardized reporting, including responder analysis, number needed to treat routine PRO collection, and using targeted PRO instruments as primary outcomes are all very important. And then we have to identify the domain that we think will change with intervention. So as we look at future strategies of PRO, certainly routine use in ambulatory practice to use it in shared decision-making for prognostication and goals of care, as well as for determining clinical meaningfulness, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. Certainly prognosis, uh, there have been multiple studies, Dr. Heidenreich uh, published this, uh, looking at uh, the uh, impact of quality of life and uh, the higher, the better your quality of life, the better your overall survival. And in fact, uh, in a more recent study, uh, once again, we looked at this. And if you look at change scores, uh, if your um, score decreases uh, by five points, you have a greater probability of being admitted to the hospital and uh, you have a greater risk for all-cause mortality. And if your score improves, uh, there's a trend in the right direction for the adjusted hazard ratio, but it did not meet statistical significance. And if you look at the impact of hospitalization, uh, in general, patients' quality of life will uh, decrease, especially for the, the few ensuing uh, few months. However, uh, there may be some interventions that can actually mitigate some of the, the decline that you see. So as we think about care of patients and interventions that we're considering, we should think about a variety of things. Number one is how long will it take for recovery? And second is uh, the sustainability of that recovery. If we have an intervention that will take a patient and make their quality of life back to their baseline and they sustain for a lifetime uh, or long term, that's really good. If you have something uh, that will improve their outcomes, but it takes a long time to recover and it doesn't sustain, this is uh, something that we need to consider. So as we have better data, then we can actually answer questions about should an intervention happen that requires four month recovery if it's not gonna sustain and their life expectancy is six months. These are things where we can actually have detailed shared decision makings. And then finally, we need to identify the factors that may worsen quality of life, including progression of heart failure, defibrillator firing, isolated RV pacing, comorbid conditions, side effects, psychological distress, and loss of emotional support. So I would like to turn my attention to the clinically important differences. And this is something that is highly debated right now in the quality of life literature. I would actually say, that uh, what is a clinically meaningful difference is different than what's an individual change score that's important. The, the comparisons I would use is A1C, systolic blood pressure, and peak oxygen consumption. Very small differences, including like two millimeter differences in a population can actually have significant risk reductions for stroke and ischemic heart disease mortality. Uh, so if we were to look at quality of life scores, the question is, is a one point difference meaningful? We know that from a prognostic perspective, it is. And we need to look at trials and understand where is that clinical meaningful point? Is it five points? Uh, for the individual patient, it may be. For population difference, one point may be clinically meaningful. So as we transition to the future and the transformation of care, I would say, uh, and like to summarize, that there are many benefits in clinical practice for quality of life, including the real world, to facilitate medical decision-making, to de define the trajectory of patients, and to screen for issues, including depression and anxiety, and it allows us to provide patient-centered care. We do need shorter instruments uh, and instruments that are free. Uh, preferences, understanding who are the patients that we should be measuring this, understanding how we can implement it into clinical practice without affecting time constraints, have a better understanding of trials, as well as addressing the heterogeneity of the populations. So when we look at the future, I would actually say that we need to have an integrative model, and this does not start once the patient is progressing to end stage, but in fact, at diagnosis. So certainly we have the usual care team and I would add in sleep medicine, um, but as they become uh, progressively uh, more symptomatic, they become less survival sensitive and more symptom sensitive. And this is where the palliative care team actually can be very involved. And I would actually say they should not be involved just at the onset of the end stage where we're talking about hospice or not. They really should be involved upstream to help make these decisions. And I think the, uh, what the pandemic has told us is we can actually move forward much rap more rapidly than we typically can. And there are many potential benefits of these virtual visits, including for the patients and families that allows a better access, medical advice. We can meet patients where they are, reduces infectious exposure, 
and reduces distress and involves the caregivers. For healthcare systems in schools, certainly we can reallocate resources as a generate re revenue. We can see patients who may not travel three or four hours to see us, and it supports research efforts and it allows us to expand our network. But for clinicians and teams, it allows for faster turnover, for increased access, multidisciplinary care, and it reduces infectious exposure, as well as it allows us to provide specialty expertise uh, for these patients who, once again, will have to travel a distance in order to get this. But I also think that there are a lot of patient groups with unmet need for these new therapeutic approaches. This includes, of course, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We only have one study that actually hit its primary target um, uh, for their primary endpoint. Uh, we need to do more. Uh, the smurfless atherosclerosis, uh, resistant hypertension, and recurrent acute vascular events despite best patient care. And all of this allows us to understand how to move from the bench to approval, from the bench to implementation. And to, as we're doing this, constantly look at ways that we can drive costs down. This includes tort reform and passing savings along to patients. <coughs> and then finally, the use of wearables. <coughs> This has been work that's been done by Dr. Mintu Tarakia. And um, there are so many ways that we can use digital technology to better understand how to provide care, how to change behavior, how to monitor patients, <coughs> excuse me, and how to co-manage these patients. And with wearables, with the advanced software processing and data, the electronic health records, um, and some of the artificial intelligence um, that, uh, and machine learning, that has been created, we'll be able to have actionable clinical data. <clears throat> so with this, we have strategic frameworks, and this is the ambulatory innovation and transformation. Certainly, the, uh, Dr. Uh, Abba Kandawal is representing us um, in this strategy, and I think this is important as we continue to move forward and to meet patients where they are to promote health equity, patient and care team experience, ambulatory technology solutions, come up with more appropriate and quality uh, care as well as wellness, um, achieve our tripartite mission, and then come up with uh, ways of uh, revenue as well as uh, cost of care. Um, this allows us to solve problems, integrate within process work stream, guide the patient through, and this includes um, a better way of interfacing with our scheduling process and to leverage existing technology to change behavior. And this is an effort to have a clinical teamwork. So as we try to uh, uh, implement quality of life. Uh, I just want to highlight work that Dr. Alex Sandu is leading, and this is an implementation effectiveness trial where we're randomizing uh, patients to KCCQ collection at each heart failure visit in Epic versus Usual Care. It's a one-year follow-up, and um, they're, um, we're going to assess uh, quality of life um, and uh, look at their overall outcomes at 15-month uh, post-randomization. Hopefully, we'll have an answer to understand the impact of uh, outcomes, including the change in KCCQ at one year, treatment patterns, uh, care processes, as well as a variety of sub-studies. And this is the team that's uh, leading this pro-HF study. So uh, I would conclude by saying that this is a long road from taking the patient who presents to you with heart failure, with cardiovascular disease. We take the disease burden, we wanna help them transition to health, and we want to come up with better optimization and this includes integrating basic science advances into clinical care, transforming clinical trials into improved outcomes, meeting patients where they are in an equitable way, and then having uh, better opportunities for shared decision-making through digital technology. So in conclusion, preventing and treating heart failure at early stages improves, will improve overall outcomes. We need to help address health inequities to improve overall outcomes. And patient-reported outcomes are important targets of therapy it really can be implemented in clinical management, and it allows us to not underestimate stability. Uh, and using digital technology can drive this improved care as we continue to be the leaders here at Stanford University. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis, for that wonderful presentation. You've given us a lot to think about, especially with regard to PROs and how we can integrate um, quality of life into our practices. Um, 
we have some questions, but first I just want to say thank you so much again for kicking off Black History Month in this wonderful way. And just one more shout out. I wanted to say thank you to Talia Ochoa because she has been integral in helping us get our slides together every week. And we really appreciate all of her efforts. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ostalga for questions. Done. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and Dr. Lewis has been such an amazing leader in our department. Thank you again for leading us uh, this month and, and today. I want to again thank Dr. Dunn, Dr. Salas, also Dr. Caceres, who I did not mention at the beginning. I just realized, and actually Bob uh, messaged me right after and mentioned we should also acknowledge you, of course. Dr. Caceres, thanks so much for being so integral in everything we do, particularly in diversity and inclusion. And of course, Dr. Harmon as well, as I mentioned um, as well. Thank you, Talia, for doing all the work behind the scenes for all of Medical Ground Rounds, always. So thank you so much. I wanna get into questions and I'm gonna start right now. Uh, Dr. Lewis, first question I have here was from Dr. Leibowitz. How do you interpret elevation of the NT program B in the absence of signs or symptoms of congestive heart failure or ex exercise tolerance? Is this the so-called athlete's heart? Well, the great question and uh, the quality of life is actually not really linked to ejection fraction. That's one thing that we showed uh, over a decade ago. And although in general, it's associated with, um, with biomarkers such as N-terminal proBNP, just because you have an elevated N-terminal proBNP doesn't mean that you're going to be symptomatic. And so some of this is driven by symptom burden, by their overall exercise capacity, and then other potential culprits for for this, for instance, N-terminal pro-BNP BNP can increase in the setting of acute pulmonary embolism, COPD, um, any kind of right-sided heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, uh, anything that increases wall tension. So you may see it in the, and also chronic kidney disease, and as we get older, and it's sometimes in females more than males. And so you may be less symptomatic um, and still have an elevated N-terminal pro-BNP. I wouldn't say it's necessarily the athlete's heart. The other thing I would say is that we change our expectations. So if I get short of breath walking from here to the front door of the building, then I may think about how I'm going to walk. I may take a break so that I'm not symptomatic. And when you ask me, do you get short of breath? No, because I've adjusted my life so that I can't do it. If I like to play 18 holes of golf and I can't walk, then I'll use a cart and I can still play golf and I, it may not limit me. That's one of the reasons there's so much variability in these responses. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wang is asking a couple questions here. His first one is, are feedback loops and receptor transmitter densities adjust to changing stressors such as exogenous medications? How quickly does our physiology adapt to maintenance doses after each medication's adjustments initial gains? How often should we insist on seeing our lower resource patients since it may require transportation, copay costs, and time off of work? Right, and so that, that a lot of questions there. And so the first is I would say that that feed, feedback loop uh, linked to physiology is gonna be driven by the, pharmacal, uh, the pharmacodynamics and, the, and just the, uh, the, uh, the uh, kind of the half-life of the drug. It really depends if you were to look at um, some, uh, for some drugs, for instance, and quality of life at least, you actually see improvements within two weeks. Um, and so in fact, the biggest improvement you see is in the first two weeks. Um, in terms of exercise, it really depends on the patient because some patients are afraid to exercise because they're so limited, they're frail, and uh, you have to kind of get over that difficulty of getting started. So trying to measure in an objective way exercise physiology may be challenging if you're just looking at patient uh, steps, for instance. But if you were to put them on, uh, say, a cardiopulmonary exercise test, you can actually see improvements in a, in a, few, um, in a few months. Um, so... Uh, in heart failure in particular, the vasoreactive uh, changes um, actually can take a long time to change. And that's not gonna be changed necessarily by therapy, but changed by the exercise that can happen because of therapy. And then you see a, a more, uh, a less blunted uh, kind of uh, uh, exercise induced uh, femoral artery vasodilatation. And, and I forgot the last part and I can answer that real quickly. I. How often should we insist on seeing our low resource yeah. patients? Thank you so much. And yes, and uh, so that's actually the reason I think the video visits can be really important because um, you can do a check-in for the patient. And now there are some technologies that we may be able to use where we can actually have a digital stethoscope and actually listen to the patient. And these are things that we'll want to test uh, moving forward. Um, but our lower resource patients may be able to see us and follow up. I think it's really important because adherence it's gonna be driven by pill count and by how they feel. If they feel better, they're more likely to adhere. So I think it's important that we try to drive that early on. 
And uh, another question here, with deferred, with deferred decision making, I'm concerned there will be an unintended consequences of worsening care inequality due to provider implicit biases in patient education, messaging, and or trying to achieve course uh, concordance with some uh, socioeconomic cultural groups uh, expected lower care. Are there studies focused on such unintended consequences? Um, there are some studies that have, have looked into this. I can't, uh, this is not uh, my area, but, um, but in terms of uh, work that has been done, um, there have been uh, studies that show that uh, in general, uh, shared decision-making um, has been uh, somewhat variable. Um, I think a solution to this would be to look specifically at visual aids and uh, and uh, an actual uh, clearly vetted, culturally sensitive documents to help with those shared decision making. I think an example of this is uh, once again in the, the side of uh, LVAD study where decisions were different. And the question is, are we right or wrong? It's more concordant, but we have to kind of test that. We also did a study where we looked at video visits to understand whether or not patients were more likely to use, uh, to make decision differences about uh, uh, their code status and showed that videos were actually more effective. Uh, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a bias. Some of the impact of this could be driven not by the provider patient interaction, but in fact, by the uh, patient and their family. So if you, you can imagine that if a patient basically wants to transition care, um, but they understand that they're, they're going to cause distress to a, a spouse, or to a child, they may actually make different decisions when that spouse and child have been in the room. And we've actually studied this and shown this, but, uh, but it's specifically looking at implicit bias. Uh, I have not studied that area. Great. Uh, and I want to just uh, ask Harris one more question. Also, a great comment by Dr. Wynn. Amazing talk, Dr. Lewis. Love seeing the shift in cardiology to include PROs and quality of life. I want to end with one more question from Dr. Valentine in the comments. And thanks, Dr. Valentine, for your question. Uh, she says, uh, thank you for an outstanding presentation, Elgin. How can we better integrate research on social economic determinants with the biological? Seems like these remain siloed. Yes, uh, they are. And I think they things will change. Um, so um, we cannot continue to do clinical trials where we're unfortunately sometimes uh, race and ethnicity have been conflated with uh, social and economic determinants. That's changing because of a lot of efforts that have been done, um, including uh, with the HHA and SP with the Scientific Publishing Committee and all of the journals, but also across the board. So now with um, neighborhood deprivation index and some other strategies that we can use to measure social determinants, I think we should start implementing this routinely into our case report forms uh, to collect uh, for, uh, for clinical studies so that we can better understand how uh, therapies in a randomized fashion uh, interface with where the patient lives and all of their social determinants to understand the impact on care. Um, so I do think that this is gonna become standard. Uh, I think with some of the better um, uh, ways of collecting information through uh, EHR, we're gonna be able to implement this into our clinical practice as well. And I think it does make a big difference with regards to how we uh, uh, try to address these social determinants to impact change in behavior and also to impact overall outcomes in addition to all of the therapies that we can offer for cardiovascular disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Harrington to close this out. Great, thank you, Dr. Osdalgar. And thank you, uh, Dr. Lewis. That was a fantastic overview of uh, uh, a, a very impressive body of work. I hope we can get you to come back, Eldrin, to talk about uh, the sort of maybe overarching issue of how we go about increasing the diversity of our patients in clinical trials, which has a direct impact on our ability to understand, to Hannah's point, both the biologic, but also the, uh, the social. And uh, because we're gonna, we need a diverse patient population in trials to be able to understand that. Um, again, thank you. Thank you. And a shout out to, uh, to my colleagues who have done so much work in leadership throughout the year, but in particular um, with some of our inclusion events, Dr. Dunn, Dr. Caceres, Dr. Harmon, Dr. Salas. And uh, thanks again to our audience for joining us and uh, be back next week when we have another great lecture during uh, Medical Grand Rounds. So see everyone next week.